Uh, my topic is the perseverance of the saints, and uh, our text is, uh, actually I chose from several possible texts here. There's so many that would be good for this, but I chose a single verse. Hopefully I can finish before our time is over. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, you know this verse, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is one of the most profound and important texts of Scripture. It's rich with truth in an amazing economy of words. Just a single sentence, but it wonderfully sums up the whole character of our salvation. It is, establishes the foundation for Christian joy and confidence. And for those of us who lay hold of this truth and believe it, it settles definitively the question that troubles so many Christians is my salvation secure? And this verse says, yes, it is. For some Christians, this is the most difficult and troubling issue in all of theology. After we're converted, after we're born again and united with Christ and given spiritual life, is it possible to lose our salvation? Is it possible to fall from grace? Can a genuine Christian fall away from Christ and be lost in the end. In some circles, this is one of the most debated and controversial issues you could ever raise because people have been debating this question for generations. And it is important at the most fundamental level because how you answer that question will determine every aspect of how you live as a Christian. It colors your perspective of God. It, it, it determines the quality and the character of your faith. So this is not a minor issue, and I want to show you why to this afternoon. This, this question of eternal security happens to be the first big theological issue that I struggled with as a Christian. I came to saving faith in Christ at the end of high school. I was 17 at the time. I had grown up in a theological environment that was classically Arminian. I went to a Methodist church, and even though it was a very liberal church, and I didn't learn a lot of doctrine, I had absorbed enough Wesleyan theology to be uncertain about this issue, and the whole idea of free will and God's sovereignty, this all troubled me and confused me. And of course, the Methodists, starting with John Wesley himself, have always taught that it is possible to lose your salvation. And I had a close friend, my best friend at the time, for all those years in high school, my best friend, his father was an evangelist and a faith healer in the Assemblies of God, and they were basically Wesleyan and Arminian in their theology as well. And my friend insisted that it's possible for Christians to fall away from Christ and lose their salvation, and he felt very strongly about that. And when he learned that I was grappling with this issue, he sternly cautioned me that it is dangerous to believe that your salvation is eternally secure. But as a new Christian even, I had a very hard time reconciling that belief with just the fundamental idea of eternal life. Do I have eternal life or not? If you can lose it, by definition it isn't eternal. And it seemed to me that the whole promise of the gospel message is summed up in one of the verses I had memorized early, John 5, 24, where Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, Jesus said, but he has passed from death to life. And I knew that I had passed from death to life because my life had changed so much. I relished the truth that eternal life is mine, it, in that it is my present possession, not something I'm going to be given at the end of this earthly life, but right now, I have eternal life, Jesus said. He didn't say eternal life is something that you'll get if you're faithful enough somewhere down the line. And so it was a monumental thing for me to realize that I had passed from death unto life, and it seemed to me that if there was any possibility at all that I might fall away and slip back under the condemnation of God and lose my salvation, then eternal life didn't really mean very much. And also, I didn't feel very secure because I know my own heart. And I know that I'm not capable of keeping myself. 
And so, if you can lose your salvation, I thought, by definition, it isn't eternal life. And so that question troubled me, and I wanted to understand exactly what the Bible teaches about it. And the first church I ever joined as a new believer was a Baptist church. And it wasn't because I was a Baptist by conviction. Uh, I didn't know enough to be a Baptist. And in fact, I was suspicious of Baptists. Most Methodists are. <laughs> but I visited several churches. I'm living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where churches are either liberal or charismatic. And I was simply looking for a church where the pastor would open the Bible and teach from it. That's, that was my only requirement. And I visited several churches, and there was only one church I could find in my neighborhood where the pastor believed and preached the Bible. And so I decided to join and be baptized. In fact, it was so obvious to me that they took the Bible seriously from the time this pastor got into the pulpit that I decided to join that church the very first Sunday I visited there. I visited the morning service, and I was baptized that same Sunday in the evening service. It was a real Baptist church, you know? <laughs> so this pastor asked me to come to his office an hour before the evening service so that he could interview me to make sure that I could give a credible profession of faith. And I explained to him how I had come to Christ I came to faith by reading the scriptures on my own, and he listened to this story and encouraged me, and then when he was as satisfied as he could be that my conversion was genuine, he prayed for me. And I remember that in his prayer, he quoted the words of Romans eleven twenty nine: 29, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And that stood out to me, and so when... He, he finished praying. I asked him, what does that expression mean? The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And he explained to me that's from Scripture, and it means that God doesn't change his mind or take back the gifts that he graciously bestowed on us. I'd never heard that verse before, and I, I didn't realize when I heard him say it that it was from the Bible. And so he opened his Bible to Romans 11:29 and showed it to me. That was June of 1971, and I was not much more than six weeks old in the Lord at the time, and I had never belonged to a church where the ministry was so focused on biblical teaching, but I already had this huge theological dilemma in my head about eternal security, and so when that pastor showed me that verse, my first question to him was whether that means my salvation is forever. If God doesn't take back the gifts he gives, what about the gift of eternal life? If he doesn't revoke his call on your life, and since eternal life is a gift, wouldn't that mean that you can't lose your salvation? That was the question burning in my heart. And, and we only had 10 minutes or so before the start of the evening service, and there wasn't time for him to get into the whole eternal security issue. And so the pastor had only very short time to give me an abbreviated reply, and I remember he told me he believed that Scripture is clear, that if you are authentically saved, you can never lose your salvation, and he was the first Christian I ever met who actually would say that. And, but I quoted, he quoted a handful of verses to me to back it up, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He quoted Jude 24, God is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And this verse, Philippians 1, 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And so... That short meeting in the pastor's office, just moments before I was baptized, is when I really began to see what the Bible teaches about eternal security. And I even remember that he said, he said to me at the close, because he couldn't explain everything, he said, look, this is a huge issue. He says this is a part of a centuries-old debate between Calvinists and Arminians. And that's the first time I'd ever heard about any debate between Calvinists and Arminians. And in fact, I thought he said Armenians, and I didn't have a clue what he was talking about, but I didn't have time to ask him any more questions, and so I put this whole Calvinist-Armenian thing in the, in the back burner in my mind. <laughs> 
And I decided I'm going to look this up and find out about it the first chance I get. Now, I had no clue what a big issue it was. I spent most of my first year as a Christian studying Scripture and with a focus on the doctrine of eternal security. I devoured everything I could on the subject. I studied the difficult passages like Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10, and I was determined to make sense of everything the Bible has to say about this subject. And despite my initial confusion, I quickly began to see that biblical proof for the doctrine of eternal security, the perseverance of the saints, is massive and overwhelming. I don't know how you can read Scripture and come to any other conclusion. And I wasn't, I'll confess to you, I was not much of a Calvinist in those days. In fact, I remember during my first semester in college, I was, because I was a new Christian, that first year I went to a state university and I found a religious encyclopedia in the college library and I looked up Armenians to see what I could learn about what debate these people from Armenia had with the Calvinists. <laughs> and when I finally figured out how to spell Arminians, I found an entry about it, and most of what this religious encyclopedia had to say was far beyond my ability to make sense of at that point. I remember thinking, as I read this, I, there were five points they differed on, and I thought I agreed with the Arminians against the Calvinists on about four of those five points, but on this question of eternal security and the perseverance of the saints, I had to admit that the clear teaching of Scripture was on the side of the Calvinists. I hadn't read enough Scripture to realize the Calvinists were right on the other four points, too, but I got to that in a few years. But So that was how this doctrine of the perseverance of the saints became the first major biblical doctrine that I really applied myself to understanding, and it was a great exercise because it helped me realize that sound theology requires a lot of diligence and careful study and discipline, but it also left me with an unshakable conviction that Scripture clearly and forcibly teaches that eternal life is the present possession of every true believer. Jesus said, John 10, verses 27 through 29, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. Now, if you are in Christ, you are united with Him, and that is for eternity. Nothing can break that union. You know, in fact, the Baptists even had a favorite hymn that used the exact words of 1 Timothy 1.12 from the King James Version, I know whom I have believed. They sang it like that with those extra syllables on believed because it had to fit the meter, but I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know that hymn, right? You're Baptists. <laughs> And I, I discovered also Hebrews 7.25, where it says, Christ is able to save them to the uttermost who come to God by him. Now again, I wasn't much of a Calvinist in those days. I didn't understand anything about the doctrine of election. Coming from a Methodist background, I found the, even the word predestination to me was appalling and frightening. And I, I knew Scripture used that word, but, but I figured it must mean something else, right? And I had no clear understanding of the sovereignty of God, but as time went by, the more I studied the issue of eternal security, the more it began to dawn on me that one of the main biblical reasons that we can know our salvation is secure forever is the very same truth that is at the heart of all of the doctrines that most of us would label Calvinism, and it's this, that salvation is God's work, and it's all God's work. It's completely His work from start to finish. If you don't get anything else out of this conference, I hope you've seen that, that every aspect in the Ordo Salutis is God's work. Even our faith is a gift from God. Romans 8.30, those whom He predestined, 
He also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he glorified. And part of Paul's point in that passage is that every aspect of salvation is the work of God. It's not something I do. You ever really come to grips with that? You are not the one who even initiated your salvation. God chose you, and he drew you to Christ, and he effectually called you, and he is the one working in you even now, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, and he's accomplishing your sanctification. He will ultimately accomplish your glorification. He will keep you from falling, and no aspect of your salvation ultimately depends on you. None of it is energized by you. None of it was started by you, and none of it will be finished by you. This is one of the most basic truths of Christianity, that salvation is not a work the sinner does for God. It is a work God does for the sinner. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So even the good works we do, God prepared beforehand for us not the result of God's work in us. Those good works are, are not accomplished by the power of our own free will. God prepared them beforehand that we should walk in them, but he's the one who did it. So God even foreordained the good works that we do, and he's the one who empowers us to do them, and that means in the end, salvation is all God's work, and he always finishes what he starts. And that's the very truth our verse teaches. And as we look at it carefully this afternoon, I want to show you from this text three ironclad conclusive reasons for why every true believer, our salvation is secure and unassailable. Here's the first reason. Reason number one, that you can know your salvation is secure. Number one, God began the good work in you. If you're a Christian, you need to know this. You did not become a Christian on your own initiative. God is the one who triggered your salvation. Before you ever thought of even coming to him, he sought you. He brought you under the sound of the gospel message. He called you effectually by his spirit. He drew you to Christ. You might not have felt it, but he was doing that. And Paul is simply reiterating a truth here that you will find in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, God is always the one who initiates salvation. He's the one who began a good work in you, and if he had not first begun his good work in you, you would never have responded to him. Romans 8, verse 7, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. You couldn't come to him if he didn't draw you. And again, the thread of this truth runs right through Scripture. You get the first glimpse of it in the garden after the fall when God comes looking for Adam while Adam is doing his best to try to hide from God. God is always the initiator in salvation. You wouldn't be a believer at all if God had not first chosen you and called you and drawn you to Christ, opened your heart to believe and graciously given you the ability to lay hold of Christ by faith. And in fact, you didn't choose salvation for yourself out of your own free will. God chose you first. Jesus told his disciples, John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and ordained you. And in the familiar words of 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. His love for us is the cause of every righteous desire that we have. So, God is the one who began the work of salvation in you, and if he had not made the first move, you wouldn't be a believer at all. That's why the Apostle Paul opened his epistle to the Ephesians with these words. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So that's the idea. Here we are once again face to face 
with the sovereignty of God, the doctrine of election, and the biblical truth of predestination and the doctrines of grace. And you can't believe in the perseverance of the saints apart from those truths, or else your theology is going to be inconsistent with itself. God began this good work in you, and that is exactly what this passage says, and that's the reason you're secure. God began this good work. I realize many people struggle with the truth of God's sovereignty, especially in salvation. Like, that's supposed to be the independent choice of the sinner's own free will. That's not what Scripture says, and right here it is. In fact, you know, some people do all kinds of exegetical gymnastics to try to avoid the simple truth of our verse. I read one commentary that said, you know, this book isn't talk this verse isn't talking about salvation at all. This guy pointed out that in Philippians 4 later in this book, Paul is talking about the Philippian church saying that they that they are the only church that supported him financially on his missionary journey. And so this commentator claims that the good work in this verse that Paul is referring to is simply the stewardship of their money and that Paul is simply encouraging them to continue in that work until his financial needs were fully met. He's saying, I'm confident that God is going to motivate you to keep giving me funds. That is a horrible corruption of this text. And it violates both the context and the plain words of the verse itself. This is not about the sharing of their means. It isn't about any good work that they did. It's not even about a good work that God had done in their midst. It's about the work God began in them, a work that Paul was confident would continue until its completion. Notice, not when finally they'd given their last available extra money, but at the day of Jesus Christ. He's talking about when the Lord returns and even our bodies will be raised from the dead and glorified, and that's when the work will be complete in the day of Christ. And therefore, this can only refer to the work of salvation. This is an explicit statement of the perseverance of the saints. Actually, the perseverance of God's work in redeeming the saints, which is what guarantees that they persevere as well. But notice the immediate context. He's, he's speaking, verse 5, about their partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And he uses a, the Greek word koinonia, which you know speaks of fellowship. And in fact, the King James Version translates it this way, I thank my God for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So this is clearly a text about their salvation, their fellowship in the gospel. And it's therefore a promise that applies to all of us, every Christian. It speaks of the absolute certainty that God will complete what he began. And the Philippians, of all people, would certainly have understood Paul's meaning. Scripture gives a fairly complete record of how the church at Philippi was founded. You know that Paul was the human instrument uh, through, through which the gospel was brought to that city. But notice, Paul is not referring to himself as the one who began this good work. In human terms, it's true that he was the founder of this church. It was the first church in Macedonia, and therefore, it, this was the gateway through which the gospel came into Europe. But Paul didn't pretend that this was a work he himself had done. He regards it as God's work. He's just the human instrument through which God accomplished his work. And that was always Paul's perspective, by the way. At the end of his first missionary journey, he returns to Antioch in Acts 14, verse 27, Luke writes this, and when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he, that's God, had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. So this was Paul's perspective. It was God's work. It wasn't Paul who began it. It wasn't even the Gentiles themselves by open the, by, who opened the door by some independent exercise of their own free will. They didn't start this. It was God who began the work in them. And remember how God started the work in Philippi? You turn to Acts 16. And let's look at how this church at Philippi was started. Acts 16, verse 7. Paul and his party are taking the gospel through Asia Minor. That's the Turkish peninsula. 
They attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So now Paul is at Troas, still in Asia Minor, and he's awakened in the night by a vision, verse 9. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul was sovereignly restrained from taking the course he had planned on, and instead he goes to Macedonia in response to a vision that he received from God. Paul didn't produce the vision. God did. So that everything in this passage speaks of God's sovereign control over these events. It's clear that God's in charge. He keeps Paul from going where he planned. He gives him a vision of where to go, and it's all God. Verse 12, Paul comes to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Paul and Luke says, we remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Who opened her heart? It doesn't say Lydia opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart. Lydia and her household are baptized, and they invite Paul to come and stay as a guest in their home, verse 15. And then verses 16 through 18 describe how a young woman with a spirit of divination, a professional soothsayer, begins to follow Paul and Luke around saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation, which is true, right? But as Spurgeon says, I think, the, even in the, in the mouth of a demon, even the truth is a blasphemy. So after a few days of this screeching demon-possessed woman, Luke says Paul was grieved and he turned and rebuked her and she was delivered from the bondage of this evil spirit and so she couldn't tell fortunes anymore. And this woman's masters were deprived of the profits of her soothsaying. She was probably a servant whom they owned and in addition to being in bondage to a demon. So this was, this was a woman in a darkest kind of slavery and the Lord released her and these men lost their means of income, and so they brought trumped-up charges against Paul and Silas and had them beaten and imprisoned and physically restrained with stocks on their feet, verses 19 through 24. And so Paul and Silas did what you would expect them to do. They started a prison ministry. They held a prayer meeting in the prison at midnight, verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Who did that? God did. And he opened the heart of the Philippian jailer as well so that he was saved too. And that was the start of the church at Philippi. God orchestrated it all. And that's clear from Luke's account, isn't it? Paul's journey to Macedonia, the opening of Lydia's heart to believe, the earthquake, the salvation of the jailer, it was clearly God who began the good work in them. The very means by which this church was founded underscores in every detail the truth of God's sovereignty in salvation. And it's true across the board. God is always the initiator in salvation. Our faith does not unleash God's saving work. Our faith is the result of his work in us. He begins the work. And that's why Jesus said in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And verse 65, no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. That's Jesus expressly saying, you can't even come unless God starts the process. And did you realize, I said this earlier, but I know there are people who might want to dispute it, even your faith is a gift of God. He gave it to you. If God had not opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, as it says in Acts 14, 27, no Gentiles would be saved. 
If he hadn't opened the heart of Lydia, she wouldn't have been saved. If he hadn't graciously drawn our hearts to Christ and enabled us to believe, none of us would be believers at all. In Romans 12, verse 3, Paul uses this truth as an argument for Christian humility. For by the grace given to me, I say, he says, to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has given. If God didn't assign us a measure of faith, we couldn't be saved. Look at Philippians 1.29. This is later in this same chapter. So go back to Philippians 1 and look at verse 29. Paul says, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. God not only gave you your faith, he gives you the suffering that comes behind it. So our faith was granted to us by the loving providence of a gracious and sovereign God. He is the one who began a good work in us. Now, think about this. If, if you didn't initiate your faith by your own free will choice, if God is the one who began the work of faith in your heart, then saving faith itself is supernatural. It's not natural. It's supernatural. And that's what I believe Jesus meant when he said, faith has the power to move mountains. If it's authentic faith, then it comes from God. If it's genuine faith, it's not merely a human opinion or a decision we make on our own or a wish we have that we really, really believe in. That would be a mere delusion. That's not faith. But faith is a work of God in us. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. That's Ephesians 2, 8. And, and there's great security in that. Real faith endures. It perseveres. Hebrews 11 is a chronicle of those who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. And through all of that, the writer of Hebrews is saying, their faith endured and it remained unshaken because the source of that faith is God himself. And not only that, if you understand that God is the one who began the work of your salvation, if you understand that Christ is the author and finisher of your faith, you will find in that truth an endless supply of grace to help in time of need. Because when you feel yourself weak or unsteady, you can pray like the father of the demon-possessed boy in Mark 9, 24, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Cure my unbelief. Or like the apostles in Luke 17, verse 5, Lord, increase our faith. Why would we pray that if we didn't recognize that God is the source of our faith? He's the one who gives us faith. You can always pray for more faith because God is the true source of genuine faith. And that brings us to a second reason we know our salvation is secure. Reason number one, God began the good work in you. Reason number two, God is still at work in you. Not only did God begin the good work of salvation, he oversees it and he maintains every detail of the work as we progress towards perfect Christ-likeness. So God doesn't merely start the work of salvation and leave it to see what we might make of it. He doesn't begin the work and then abandon it to watch and find out what might become of it. He continues the work. Now, that work won't be complete until we are fully glorified, and we'll talk about that in the next hour. But sometimes, let's be honest, because of our sin and the weakness of our flesh, the progress seems frustratingly so slow, hard to trace, and there may be even times when you fear it's going to fail. But God has not abandoned the work. He is continuing his work in us even now. That is the clear meaning of our text. And notice how Paul underscores this same idea again one chapter later than this in Philippians 2, verse 13. It is God who works in you 
both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, he tells them. But don't forget who began the good work in you and who is the only sanctifying power in your life even now. It's God. So as you're working out your salvation, remember that it's God who's at work in you. That's his point. It's not a contradiction to say God is at work in you, therefore work out your own salvation. It's a good reason to stay at the task and be steadfast, knowing that God is at work in me. And the true doctrine of the perseverance of the saints means far more than people imagine. It doesn't mean that you can fall away from Christ and abandon the faith completely and live like the devil and still be confident you're going to go to heaven. That's not what it means. It means that if your faith is authentic, you will not fall away. If there are people who seem to be Christians for a time and then abandon Christ completely, and there have been a few celebrities like that lately, they cease believing, they turn against the truth of Scripture, you can be certain their faith was never authentic to begin with. The Apostle John wrote, 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out so that it might be plain that they're not of us. God lets people go into apostasy in order to reveal the fact that their faith isn't real to begin with. That's as clear as it can be. True believers do not fall away from Christ. By God's power, they are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's 1 Peter 1.5. Now, obviously... Christians do still sin, and in fact, we learn from Scripture that believers are capable of sometimes the most appalling and grievous kinds of sin. You have David, who was a man after God's own heart, who committed adultery and, and basically murder, and then lied to cover it all up. Lot lived a whole life of worldly, backslidden carelessness. But 2 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8 tells us that Lot had a righteous soul that was vexed by the filthy conduct of Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't glory in it. He didn't like it. And David, even in his worst rebellion, never lost his faith. He didn't fall away. In fact, you can remember that when Peter was about to be sifted like wheat by Satan, Jesus told him, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. His courage failed, his boldness faltered, his willpower lost its force, and he sinned in a grievous way, basically similar to what Judas did, but he never fell away from his love for Christ. His faith didn't fail, and that's what Christ was praying for. Hebrews 7.25 says, Christ always lives to make intercession for every one of us. So he prays for our faith to endure. That is how he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. It's one of the reasons no true Christian can ever fall away and no one's able to pluck us out of Christ's hand. But the greatest assurance of our security lies in this, that our salvation is God's work in the first place and in the second place, He's the one who began it, and he's still at work in us, empowering us to persevere, and he guarantees that the work of salvation will continue to completion. That's why real faith perseveres. And that's why this doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is, is called that. It's the perseverance of the saints because true believers always persevere, even if they falter and stumble along the way. And God guarantees that. But again, don't imagine that our perseverance is guaranteed by our own willpower. I hope you don't have that much confidence in your own flesh, because if it were only a matter of personal willpower, we would all fail. God is the one who maintains and safeguards and preserves the faith of his elect. That's why he is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory. It's God, and it's God alone who is able to keep us from falling. So that the security of our salvation is actually one of the great promises of the new covenant. Jeremiah 32, verse 40, God says, I will put fear of me in their hearts, 
that they may not turn from me. And again, we see that it's God's work in us that guarantees our perseverance. Psalm 125, verse 1. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. Why? Why are the righteous so steadfast and sure like Mount Zion? Verse 2. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. And the epistle of Jude closes with that classic benediction to him who is able to keep you from falling. Listen to how that epistle begins. It's addressed to those who are called, who are called beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. They are called beloved in God, the Father, and they are kept for Jesus Christ. It's God who called us, and it's God who keeps us. And that is the same truth we find in our verse. God, who began the work in us, carries it on even now. He's preserving the work he began. And he will continue it until he finally brings his work to full fruition. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 5. But our sufficiency is from God. God is the one who empowers Every good thing we do as Christians, so that from the first step to the last, it is not because of it is not because of works, but because of him who calls. So then our salvation depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy, Romans 9. God not only began a good work in us, but he also keeps it alive and active, and he will do this until the day of Jesus Christ. And here's the third reason that we know our salvation is secure. First, God began the good work in you. Second, he is still at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And now third, God will complete the work he began. And that's a guarantee. In fact, if you're reading this text from the New American Standard Bible, your version says, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. If you use the New King James Version, it says, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And each of those versions brings out a different nuance of the verb that's in that phrase. The Greek word is epitaleo, which speaks of finishing something, of fully accomplishing a thing, of bringing it to perfection. This is a guarantee that God will not only finish, but bring to absolute and utter perfection the thing he started in you. And notice how Paul describes elsewhere this work that God began in us. Listen to Romans 8, verses 29 and 30. I referred to it earlier. Now, listen to the full text this time. These are familiar verses, but they describe precisely how God began and carries out and will complete the work in us. Romans 8, 29 through 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So it goes from eternity past to eternity future and Paul's point is it's all God's work. And what is it that he's trying to do? He's conforming us to the image of his son. So he has to do it perfectly. The work began at regeneration when the principle of divine life awakened us from our spiritual death and enabled us to receive the things of the Spirit of God, which according to 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man cannot receive because they're folly to him and he isn't able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. God awakened our understanding to those things and he enabled us to lay hold of them by faith. And that's the call he refers to in Romans 8.29. It's the effectual saving call of God. That's the beginning of his work in us. And the work continues as God conforms us to Christ's image, and it will be concluded at the day of Christ when our glorification is complete. And Paul describes that day in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. And the Apostle John describes it in shorter terms this way, 1 John 3, 2. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we'll see him as he is. Paul wrote of it again at the end of chapter 3 of this Philippians epistle. He says, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. He's talking about the great power that enables him to complete this work to absolute perfection. Paul looked forward to that, and he counted it as a certainty. As he says in our text, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's an absolute certainty. I'm sure of this, he says, because God began the work, and he's still doing it, and he always completes what he starts. Numbers 23, 19. He, has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? The answer is he will. He always completes what he starts. Now, Quickly, in closing, what does this truth mean for us in practical terms? Well, first and most obviously, this promise is a great comfort and encouragement in the midst of all of life's difficulties. Consider the circumstances in which the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle to the Philippians. He's being dragged around in chains. He's a prisoner of the Roman government. He'd been shipwrecked and beaten and stoned and persecuted. And he chronicles his own earthly misadventures in 2 Corinthians 11. And I won't read it to you, but it's a long list of difficulties he'd gone through. And then on top of all those miseries, he says he was burdened about the inevitable problems and difficulties in all the churches that he'd founded, which sounds like, doesn't it, a recipe for the worst kind of despair. Everyone in Asia had abandoned him. But Paul's mind brings him back to this truth that it is God who began the work. And he leaned on the assurance that God would complete what he started. And that brought him the deepest kind of joy and confidence. And this whole Philippian letter, the theme is about joy. It's one of the sunniest and most cheerful epistles Paul ever wrote. And this text, our text, is the key verse. It's the whole foundation of Paul's confidence. And this is the wellspring of the joy that he was writing about. This is the truth from which he drew so much confidence about his own future and the future of the believers at Philippi. He knew that God was still at work in them and that God would bring that work to perfection. Why would anyone doubt the doctrine of the perseverance of saints? Well, some fear it might lead to carelessness and spiritual sloth among Christians. I want to suggest to you that another practical application of this truth is precisely the opposite. It ought to motivate us to diligence. Because what greater encouragement is there to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling than the knowledge that it's God who's at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure? You know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the very argument Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Spurgeon said, you know, if you could be well assured that in a certain line of business you would make a vast sum of money, would that confidence lead you to refuse that business? Or would it lead you to lie in bed all day or desert your post altogether? Spurgeon says, no, that assurance that you would prosper would make you diligent. If any runner at the races should be confident that he is destined to win, would that make him slacken his speed? He says, Napoleon believed himself to be the child of destiny. Did that freeze his energies? Listen, confidence and assurance are greater motivators than the fear of failure. If I thought the outcome of my salvation rested entirely on the power of my own will and that at the end of life I might fail and be damned forever, I might give up in despair. But the greatest encouragement of all is knowing that God is at work in me and he intends to bring his work to perfection. And finally, there's even an application of this text for unbelievers. If you're listening to me and you are without Christ, don't miss this point, because in this text lies the very heart of gospel truth. 
Salvation is all God's work, which means you can't atone for your own sin. You can't reform yourself, no matter how much willpower you apply to the process, because can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Neither can you do good if it's in your nature to be evil. That's Jeremiah 13, 23. Now, obviously, it's impossible for a leopard to change his spots or for a man to change his skin color, no matter how much willpower we exert, except somehow Michael Jackson did it. I don't... <laughs> but that doesn't negate the point. Because even when that's done, it's only a superficial change. If you are without Christ, what you need is a new heart, the deepest, most fundamental kind of change. And only God can do that for you. And the only means by which he will do that is Christ. I've referred to Hebrews 7.25 a couple of times. Let me quote it one more time. It says, Christ is able to save them to the uttermost who come to God by him. He can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He is the way and the truth and the life, and he invites all who are spiritually thirsty to come to him for salvation. He said, John 7.37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And in the closing verses of the Bible, Revelation 22.17 says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And the, let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life take it without price. That's the way of salvation. And when God begins that work, he sees it through to the very end. Let me quote Spurgeon one more time. I have to do this because I can't do it without two quotes from Spurgeon. He said, we preach no rickety gospel which will not bear your weight. It is no chariot whose axles will snap or whose wheels will be taken off. This is no foundation of sand that may sink in the day of the flood. Here is the everlasting God pledging himself by covenant and by oath, and he will write his law in your heart that you should not depart from him. He will keep you that you should not wander into sin. And if for a while you stray, he will restore you again to the paths of righteousness. You will persevere if you're a true saint. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the finished work of Christ and for the unfinished work of our sanctification and for the promise that you will complete what you began in us. May our lives and our lips proclaim the grace that we have been shown until you bring us to absolute perfection at the day of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.